Lord Christian soldiers, I invite you to pay attention to our song leader this morning, Diane. We praise you. We 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. You may be seated. 
Oh, yes, I do remember, she says, and I know that there will come a day when I will be reunited with my brother. And then Mary comes along. She, too, had the same sentiment. Only, Jesus, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. But Jesus' timing, God's timing, the Spirit's timing is always perfect. And so Jesus asks <coughs> where Lazarus has been laid. And as he approaches that stone that has been rolled over the grave, he weeps. And so when we wonder, Jesus, where were you when our friend died? Where were you when Lazarus died? We see here a picture of exactly where Jesus was and is. He was with you. He is with us. Whether we recognize it, whether we acknowledge he is with us. When Duke was taking his last breaths, he was holding hands with a man. And you know what they were saying? Many of you heard this. Do you not see the love of God in Christ, now known to us in the Spirit, that Jesus in that moment was weeping right along with them? And yet, that's not the end of the story. Jesus breaks into humanity in a whole host of different ways, into our lives, into our broken and needy places. And he weeps with us because he too knows the experience of being human and yet not the rest of the story. And so the stone gets rolled away. Jesus is forewarned, you know, it's going to be a little smelly because Lazarus has been dead several days now. Jesus says, do it anyway. And as they do, <coughs> Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. Some versions say, Lazarus, come forth. And they think for us because Duke is celebrating his own jazz for Jesus in heaven right now. So this today, while we celebrate him and we remember him, this is for us. Because we now are here. And he is no longer with us. And so the opportunity and the invitation is for us to wake up, wake up to life all around us, wake up to how God is present in our lives, how Christ loves us even when maybe we don't love him, even when maybe we don't know him, even though maybe we don't understand. And that's all right. Waited four days to go back and see Mary and Martha and Lazarus. You think he can take a little bit of, God, why is your timing your timing? Yeah, I think so. And then we remember. It's not just God's timing. It's that God is the resurrection and the life in Jesus. 
when I say a life well lived, a man well loved, because he didn't first love the Lord. The Lord first loved him. And Duke responded to that love in a whole host of ways that many of you know way better than me. But I think the message for us is receive that gift, that legacy of faith that Duke has left for us, but not just like Okay, I guess maybe go to church every week and you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll believe in God. Do flood life, didn't he? He loved life. He loved life because somebody loved him. The Lord Jesus Christ loved him and loves us. And so I think. Just saying. I think maybe, I think maybe he would say to us today, wake up. Wake up. There's a whole life to be lived. And remember that God loves you. And there's one of our friends would say, God loves you, and there's not a darn thing you can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Dan Mackey. 
He played string bass for a number of churches, and he and his wife are not attended. He also played for the Burt Blaine American Heart Walk for 15 years. While living in Ohio, <laughs> he performed with many combos and some well-known names. He was involved with a number of vocations throughout the years. WLWD Television, Kersher Hilton, Colette Advertising, Dynamic Displays, Custom Cast, Der Kriegspielers, yes, I speak a little German, Heritage USA, both serving the Tin Soldier Market, TSR, Dungeons and Dragons, Creative Concepts, and Dry Foam Carpet Cleaning. He's predeceased by his parents, Opal and William, survived by his wife and best friend of 26 years, Annette. His first wife, Ruth, also deceased, mother of his children, including Sherry and Ron, Bruce, Jonathan and Carrie, Laura, Samantha, and Shelly, and Jim. There are also two adopted sons, Daniel and, ben Daniel and Benjamin, 13 grandchildren, he is further survived by his sister Mary, sister-in-law Alice, along with stepchildren Jeff and Gaynell, Eric and Lynn, Kent and Lori, Lisa and Russ, also six step-grandchildren and two step-great-grandchildren. He leaves behind many musician and adventure wargaming friends. Duke donated his body to UW Wisconsin Medical School, particularly to research pulmonary fibrosis in hopes of one day finding a cure. The family, most grateful to a Grace Hospice, Kathy and Bob of Mercy Home Healthcare, Dr. Jane Anderson of Mercy Clinic South, Dr. J. Tuck, Mercy Lung Center, and dear friends, Wayne and Diane, Gary and Glenn, and Phil for their constant concern, visits, and helpfulness. They also want to thank Brian Beal of Uncle Duke's Aging. Now I'm going to share with you a video recording from Pastor Glenn.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jim Getz, and I'm a toy soldier of war game. Now that sounds like an admitting addiction. Well, I guess I am. You see, 20,751 days ago, plus or minus two, I saw this guy named Duke on television with these toy soldiers. And as Duke would put it, my grand obsession started. Quick disclaimer here, I'm only qualified to talk to you about Duke and Wargame. This is not intended to diminish the memories of those of you who knew Duke as a gifted jazz musician a small business entrepreneur, or through his many other interests. Unfortunately, for the past 20 days, we have all been mourning the death of Duke. But today, we gather together to celebrate the life of Duke's icon. This is something that I think Duke would be very much in favor of, because he celebrated life every day. Just for a moment, take a quick scan through your library of Duke memories. Ignore the when and the where. Just focus on how you felt. If you're like me, you were smiling, laughing, and full of anticipation for what was about to happen. Duke could just make us feel good. I've often wondered how he was able to do that. For a long time, I just believed he was a wizard and he was enchanting us. <laughs> but I think the real magic was that Duke was the most passionate personality I've ever known. If Duke liked something, he liked it passionately. And if Duke didn't like something, he didn't like it passionately. And even if Duke didn't care one way or another, he did that passionately too. <laughs> now, in fairness, while this passion was wonderful to us outsiders, I suspect that it may have occasionally been viewed differently by family members. Back in 1970, Duke was living in Dayton, Ohio at the time, and was organizing one of his already famous weekend-long big games. This event was to honor David Chandler, a visiting professor from Sanders to the UK, teaching at Ohio State. Don't say anything. <laughs> the, the, and the world's foremost authority on the pole. I drove over from Columbus a week or two before the game to coordinate with Duke. And as I drove up to Duke's house, I could see one of the boys, and I don't know whether it was Bruce or Tom, cutting the grass in the front yard. They see a tranquil American family life. I parked in the driveway, and as I was getting out of the car, the front door burst open, and Duke came steaming out, shouting, what are you doing out here cutting the grass? 
You're supposed to be inside painting soldiers. <laughs> this was around the time that they had started a small company called Custom Cast to produce toy soldiers. And when I say small company, I mean small. If I remember correctly, the first production facility was in a converted chicken coop. <laughs> be that as it may, the miniature wargaming business would never be the same. So much of what is standard today was first done by Duke's custom cast. And I must mention one of Duke's favorite things. Duke loved coming up with product names. He was always trying to add a bit of whimsy by using a unique name. He called this product branding. But I think it was to help adults not feel guilty about buying toys. <laughs> One of his favorite methods was to use one of two endings of creating a name. The first was I-Q-U-E, as in Napoleonique, one of the rule sets in his Napoleonic product line. Another was Fantastiques, the name of his fantasy figure line, which was one of the first full fantasy lines ever produced. The other ending was E-Q-U-E. -E. This showed up in Napoleonettes, his Napoleonic line, and Confederates, his American Civil War line. And of course, his favorite ETPE, Annie. <laughs> In all these years, you thought it was your laughing eyes and your face smiles <laughs> that first attracted Duke, but no, I hate to tell you, it was your pet. <laughs> Duke was always trying to promote retail sales. At one point, he was driving an RV all over the country to small towns and big cities promoting miniature war games. He trained store owners, put on demo games, and instructed any and everyone in the incredible stain painting technique. It was Duke as Johnny Appleseed of war games. And like Johnny, he planted many seeds and fertilized them well. And as we all know, no one could spread fertilizer like Duke. <laughs> then Heritage, and eventually a senior VP of TSR, the Dungeons and Dragons folks. But I think by this time, fun had left the building for Duke. In a sense, he was a victim of his own success. Duke was an entrepreneur, but wargaming had become adventure gaming, which was Duke's phrase, by the way, and adventure gaming had become big business. Big business with its schedules and endless meetings was not Duke. So he left the business part of the hobby and returned to the hobby part of the hobby, and in my opinion, entered into what may be his most important contribution to the hobby. And this is where I would like to applaud Duke's biggest cheerleader in the story, and that. You were his touchstone in providing love, encouragement, support, and stability at this critical time in Duke's life. Thank you. Duke had been known for his big games for well as long as I had known him. So focusing his time and energy into raising the big game to an art form, an extravaganza, as they came to be known, or a dukaganza, as we call them, <laughs> was a completely natural thing to do. These started out as, a, as one game, featuring the principal armies of a specific historical or fantasy period, all beautifully painted, with terrain to match. But of course that wasn't enough for Duke. And the whole concept sort of tended to expand. In 1991, Duke called me to tell me he was going to do not one, not two, but three battles from the Zulu Wars at Historicon. That's the largest national historical gaming convention. After some discussion, Duke proposed that he drive down from Wisconsin to Columbus with his boys, Daniel and Benjamin, stay the night, and then the four of us, along with my stepson Larry and Don Featherstone, would travel the next day to Historicon in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Don Featherstone, who was one of the pioneers of wargaming in the UK, happened to be visiting me at that time. I said, Duke, that's six people and three battles in your van, plus luggage. <laughs> Duke said, don't worry. It's a big van, there will be plenty of room. <laughs> so cometh the day. Duke shows up, and there was plenty of room in the van, because he had roped 12 big boxes of troops and terrain to the roof, all covered in plastic.
traffic in Kansas. It looked like a Conestoga light. <laughs> and then I found out the Duke had planned activities for everyone so that no one would be bored on a seven hour day to his door. I got the drive. Don to ride shotgun. But being a Brit, Don had not heard this phrase before and was quite excited <laughs> until he found out that he didn't really get to carry a shotgun. <laughs> His official duty was to tell stories and entertain the rest of us. Duke and the boys got to sit in the first class lounge and work on crafts. It seemed that Duke had contracted to paint and deliver a feudal army to a guy at the store con and Duke was just a little bit behind in getting in dust. So Duke and the three boys got to paint as we traveled over Hill and Dale. The trip went fine, the feudal army was completed and delivered. Don got a great story to tell back home. Daniel and Benjamin completed the rite of passage for Cypher males, that is, painting soldiers under pressure. Remember the long one. My stepson Larry got an extended painting lesson from Duke. The only long-term effect is that if you ask Larry how long it takes to paint something, he may give you the answer in miles rather than minutes. <laughs> in the end, Duke produced over 40 of these gaming masterpieces, and they are now owned and traded by gamers around the world. But these games were more than just works of gaming art. They were magic. I never played in one of Duke's games because I didn't want to take a place from someone who didn't have access to Duke like I had. But I always watched these games. Just to observe the odd looks on the faces of the players. They were transported through time and space to the world of that game. They were totally in awe. And when the game was over, they left for the magic stone. They took it home and shared it with people they regularly gave. They created their own big games and presented them at local and regional conventions. And the people who played in those games did the same thing. And so the magic spread. It's no wonder that during this period that Duke became known to everyone as Uncle Duke, because he was part of everyone's wargaming family. And this is at the core of Duke's legacy. Duke was a man who changed one small corner of the world. He helped build a multifaceted hobby that brings historic as well as fantasy worlds alive, delivers a lifetime of entertainment, personal satisfaction, and most importantly, friendships, like 20,751 new friendships, plus or minus two. For the past several months, I've been trying to figure out a fitting memorial for Duke that all war gamers could participate in. I wasn't having much luck, but then I finally had an idea. In the best tradition of World War II, Kilroy was here graffiti. I thought that we should all paint on the wall of one of our miniature war gaming buildings. Uncle Duke was here. <laughs> then I had a better idea. The sign should read, Uncle Duke is here. Because every time you put troops on the table, every time you roll the dice, Every time you put brush to casting or see a new line of miniatures, Duke will be there by your side, whispering in your ear, isn't this wonderful? Have you ever had so much fun? <laughs> Finally, the most important part of participating in this memorial for me is to say, Duke was my friend. He changed my life, and I miss him. Thank you. My name is Jack Farina. I'm the uh, director of the Jack Farina Big Band. Couldn't think of any other name. <laughs> <laughs> Society 
syncopators or the hot mamas, so we just left it that way. I want to thank Annette for giving me this honor to talk about Duke and his music. With Duke, it was always about his music. Always. And our relationship, I tried to ask her, and we tried to figure out, it's been pretty close to 30 years that we had a relationship where I played the drums, and he was the leader, and he played the guitar. And um, I, think, I think that part of it was very, very important because of the fact that he always had the lead, he had the melody, and I accompanied him. And I, I enjoyed doing it. Um, I had no problem with that. Duke um, uh, had a group, cool jazz, that I was fortunate to play with. And uh, over the years, we had a good musical bond. Uh, I think he never really overstepped uh, any music that we played together. And I was very happy to be the accompaniment. My daughter said, uh, just talk from the heart. So uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Not to get sad, or not to get sentimental, or not to get morbid, but just giving you some things because music um, to him and music to me together, you know, really came from the heart. Uh, but and that asked me to talk about the big band. That's a very unusual experience. It was a 15-piece big band. It was 16 with Duke, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into that later. And um, we had arrangements. We've been in existence as long as I've, you know, been with Duke. Uh, 25, 30 years, and he played guitar, and he played rhythm guitar. Now, I have to define that, because rhythm guitar helps the drummer, thank God, keep a good, steady beat. And that's what I relied on Duke to do. Yes, he was a soloist. He was an arranger, okay? And he could play and make arrangements and, and play almost classical jazz. But when he played with my big band, he kept a strict tempo on rhythm guitar. And that's what I asked him to do, and he said, I'll do it. And he never, never overstepped, you know, any, any type of bounds um, that uh, forced his solos and so forth. We had arrangements where uh, we didn't have very many guitar solos. Uh, and uh, so he brought a couple. And he said, would you like to try these? I said, sure. So we tried a couple, and he had a couple that he always did ask for, but he never demanded it. He could have, because he was that good in, in what he did, playing rhythm guitar, playing classical jazz, playing jazz, and um, arranging. And I'll never forget that he, uh, we played for uh, the uh, Blaine's Farm and Fleet uh, Walk one time with the, with the trio. And um, he handed me this arrangement, which was very, very good. And he said, here, here's a, here's a chart. And it was a guitar part with all the chords and notes. And I said, Duke, I'm a drummer. What do I, I, what do, I do with that? You know, he said, just play it. And I'm glad I did, because I learned from looking at that chart and reading that chart how to accompany better. And he really helped me with that. And uh, he had good arrangements, very structured, very uh, defined, very patterned out, but always great music. But the big band, I just want to dwell on that just for a moment. Um, we used to have singers, or aspiring singers, that would come uh, to the dances and they would want to sing. And I said, well, do you have, do you, we had arrangements. We never, we have like Betty Goodman, Glenn Miller, um, Count Basie, things like that. Uh, and um, I said, you have your own arrangements. No, no, we don't have any arrangements. I go, well, what key do you sing in? Well, I really don't know. I said, go see the guitar player. And he, I, I sent the people over to Duke, and by golly, he sat there and he worked it out. He worked out what key, he worked out what to play, he told the other musicians, you know, what to play as far as a small group. 
And some of these were very good, some of these I hired, and uh, actually I would always send them over to do, um, you know, to, to work that out. Just one more thing on the rhythm guitar, okay? Um, he really helped the rhythm section, and maybe if you don't understand uh, what that's all about, what you do is you just strum. Right on. You gotta do that for the dancers, okay? Never complained. He never, you know, thought we were taking advantage of his musicianship. And um, it was just wonderful to have him do that and really help the rhythm section out, made the big band sound much better, kept it in pace. And um, uh, that part of it, you know, uh, was, so, was so meaningful to me to have someone like that do that. I'm going to close this up with an incident, though. And again, I don't want to be, like I said, you know, sentimental or anything, but it was one chart sat down by Duke Ellington. And we had an arrangement of that given to us by my good friend Tony Scottwell, who was a professional trumpet player. And I'll try to make this meaningful. It called for four trumpets and a solo trumpet. Well, Tony was in Las Vegas. He just gave me the chart to use. Who's going to play solo trumpet? So I asked Duke. I said, Duke, can you play the solo part? I mean, it was an arrangement for a solo trumpet. It was extensive. It was improvisation. It was jazz all the way through. He said, I'll do it. So he played the chart, sat and down. It was his number. They used to ask for it all the time. And Duke had the lead solo on that in place of the trumpet. Well, when Duke wasn't playing or did not play with the, able to play with the band anymore, I didn't replace anybody playing that chart. We didn't play that. We didn't play sat and down. It was Duke's number, and that's the way it was. Maybe, you know, in the future, as maybe a tribute, I'll probably find someone who can play that, because it was a very difficult improvisational part. And that's the way it was with Duke. And the other thing about it was he used to bring um, students uh, to help him and to study while he was playing with the big band. Uh, and uh, they used to uh, learn from him. They'd sit down next to him, maybe once in a while, he'd let them take a few choruses. I had the feeling that he was grooming those uh, musicians, those students, to take over when he left. And uh, I got wind of that. So before he even asked, and he would never really ask, he just sort of, I said, Duke, when you leave the band, I'm not hiring any guitar player. And I mean that. And I don't have one left. I'm not gonna have a, I'm not gonna replace you with a guitar player after all these years that you left the band and you left the rhythm section. I cannot do it. And I'm not gonna do it. And so now, Duke still has a guitar book. It's this thick. It's in a suitcase. And, and that has it. And I am, I'm not going to pick it up right now. I mean, I don't know. That's just the way I feel. Okay? Because I said, Duke, if we're playing outside in a concert like we do in, in Belden at the Phoenix Park Band Show, with a real beautiful band show, I said, when we play outside and the weather's nice, maybe you can come and set in. Well, it never really happened, but. Um, Right now, I don't know what to do with the with the um, guitar part or the guitar poker. Uh, I'm not really concerned. It stays where it's at. Who knows? Maybe it's something that I can remember and we can remember. Or, and not to be corny, maybe he's up there and he's saying, "You got the part." I can do it. <laughs> Thank you. Say, uh, 
understand what impact you've made. But what can I say to do justice to a man that had so many talents and touched so many lives? Duke was a forefather in gaming, an elegant musician, a successful businessman. But beyond that, he was a father, he was a husband, he was a friend, he was a teacher. But to me, he was a lifelong mentor. A life lesson that I learned from Duke at a young age was never be afraid of your own work. Never be afraid of who you are. And no matter what people are saying, what position you hold, what situation you're in, never forget your work. Never lose sight of who you can and who you should be. I used to go to Duke a lot when I would have problems, and he would always say in his words, Aaron, you're a mover and a shaker. Own them. That's what he used to say. And those words ring to me every time. Every time I feel down, every time I'm trying to do something new or push harder. You can always, I can always hear him. You're a mover and a shaker. And he knew that in me. At the age of 14, he could see that. He had that vision. And I'm forever grateful for him, for him being in my life. Duke and Annette were my confirmation teachers at St. John Lutheran Church in Janesville. Going over the years as the DNA class, Duke and Annette, <laughs> little did I know as a 14 year old kid, my life, my perspective, and my faith were about to be drastically changed. I remember walking into the class thinking, oh well, another boring year of Sunday school. I mean, what else do you think at 14? I, had a bag full of Cheetos waiting for me at home with my Nintendo 64, hot and ready to go. <laughs> but instantly, and I mean instantly, Duke and I connected. Like I said, Duke knew who I was, and he saw what I could be. Duke saw potential in me that I could not see, and little did I realize, but Duke would be the one to unlock it. Just like he did to many of us in the DNA. Duke and Annette opened up to us as a class and shared some of their most intimate details of their lives, which really connected us all and made that confirmation class a special group of people. I don't think that Duke and Annette really understood how they impacted our lives. I don't think you can really ever understand that, but they did in their own special way. We stayed together as a class over the years and grew closer as many of us talk today. Some of us have fallen down, but we are still together. The DNA class will always ring in our minds and in our hearts. But the one thing that they really taught was that whatever you do, do it to its fullest. Be a good person. And lend a helping hand when people ask for it. To this day, my life has never been more impacted by two people. That's a fact I don't think will ever change as I navigate through life. One of the other fondest memories I have of Duke is when he would read scripture readings in church, almost as if they were scripts in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> he was probably the only man that could keep you on the edge of your pew as if you read those scriptures. Oh, it's phenomenal to watch. I mean, you literally went to church to watch him read the scriptures. <laughs> they say that, but. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think that goes into, into saying, you know, how much passion he had in life. I mean, everything that Duke did, he did it to its fullest. He went beyond 100%. He was 150%. And you saw that in everything that he did. Duke and I were connected from the time I first met him, and we still are today. I stayed in Danville over the years and sought the counsel of my mighty mentor many, many times. I remember going to Duke with issues in high school, issues in college and even issues in life. Eventually our mentoring sessions turned into chats and updates on life, but I treasured every conversation that I had with Duke. There's no doubting that Duke was gifted, skilled in many crafts, and a masterful teacher, but mentor was a title that he wore silently. There are two people that had great influences in my life, my grandfather and Duke. To both, I am truly indebted to them and I can only hope that I can pass their teachings on like they did to me. 
As I reflect on Duke's life, I ask myself again, how do you measure a man? And I can only answer in the way Duke would. You measure a man by how many lives you can touch before the good Lord calls us home. How many lives you can truly make an impact on and help. And judging by how many of you are here today, I think it's evident that Duke is the new measure of a man. If any of us could be a quarter of Duke, the world would certainly be a louder place. <laughs> So over the time that we met and I spent time with him and Annette, it was one particularly difficult day and Mitch and I actually went to see them later that day and he was so worn out, he was so weary, but he reached out for my hand and we kissed and we talked. And we talked about life and all kinds of different things. Things that he believed, things that, that were a little bit out there. You know, the whole, what was the show he liked? Alien, ancient alien. He talked about aliens and stuff like that, you know. And you know, as a pastor, you're going, mm, that's a little bit edgy. <laughs> But you know, I loved his willingness to be so open with me and his willingness to be so honest with me and talk with me about those things. And, and I have to say that I have a son that just turned 21 this week and he didn't know me, but only from afar. He's been a gamer since he was a little boy and, and uh, you know, waiting to get home to play. Nintendo was a big thing. And I gotta say, you know, I wasn't all that thrilled about how much time he spent as a gamer. Actually, neither Mitch nor I were, but nonetheless, that continued over time. And when I came here and I found out that Duke had been a part of making Dungeons and Dragons happen, I can tell you when I was in high school, that was like the thing. That tells you how old I am. That was the thing. And I stayed away from that stuff as much as possible. I didn't understand it. I didn't get it. It was like, no, I don't think so. And then <laughs> Andrew happened. <laughs> and he knows people from all over the world because of his gaming experiences. And I called him one day and I said, you're not going to believe this. But I said, I met Duke Seyfried, and he was part of making Dungeons and Dragons happen, and he went, whoa, what? <laughs> he said, Mom, you know there was a 
time when you didn't even want me to play games. I said, yeah, 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 I know, but you know, things change, right? Moms change. And so we continued to visit and one of the last times I spent with Duke, he grabbed my hand and he said, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I want the Lord to take me home. I've done all that I wanted to do. I've done all that I needed to do. And it's time for me to go home. And then he said, you think that's okay? Is that all right for me to want to go home? He really wanted Annette to be okay. And he knew that she would be. Of course, the Lord will care for Annette, but so will we. But he said, how much? He said how much he enjoyed me. Remember the first Thursday night that he came? I have to come because I've heard how good you are. <laughs> and I thought, oh my, no pressure, right? <laughs> and he sat right about here and looked me straight in the eye the entire time that I spoke and interacted with me. And I think some of the Thursday night people were kind of a little, hmm, what's that about? But embraced him, and we just had a great time talking about God, talking about that relationship. And so the last time that I got to hear his voice, he said, you are such a fresh flower. Those are the things that warm a pastor's heart in ways that you cannot speak about very well. You know, he also said something else one of the first times that he came to worship. After he heard the message, and I walked up to him, and he was in his wheelchair, and I knelt beside him, and he grabbed my hand, and he kissed me, and he said, You are called. See, I've heard from other people, so you no, know, not that I would ever use language like this normally, but... He didn't. He called things what they were. And somebody told me later, you know, Duke didn't take any bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so if he said, you're called, you're called. Because he could see through that stuff. What a joy that was. What a, what a joy and what a privilege. And so... The last time that he was able to come to worship was actually a suggestion that Carlene had at one of our staff meetings, and I was talking about Andrew and how he was into my son into history and that sort of thing. And anyway, she said, "You know, his birthday's coming up. What a get Duke's autograph, and what a great gift that would be." So that night, I gave it to Duke, and he signed it and everything, and. So I'm out walking my dog, it's like after 9 o'clock at night one night, and I, I just couldn't wait to tell Andrew. It's like a month ago. I have got the best birthday present for you ever! Do you want to know what it is? <laughs> oh sure, Mom, he says, because, you know, <laughs> I'm a little goofy. He said, Mom, will you please tell Duke what he means to us who are gamers and historians and how he led the charge in ways that nobody else did? And I said, I will. And then about a month later, I had the opportunity to give him that bulletin. And with tears streaming. celebrate that Duke is home with the Lord. And then 
it truly is. And that's what I told him that day when he asked me if it was okay that he go home to be with the Lord. I said, oh, you're going to be home with the Lord soon and you're going to be playing jazz for Jesus in heaven. How cool is that? Well, thanks be to God. Again, he has a life well lived and a man well loved. But he loved the Lord. He loved this church. He loved everybody in it. And as everybody has already said, even, even in his illness, he did it all with passion. Thanks to you. And I'll share with you the song from Pastor Glenn. If you stand, let us join in the Apostles' Creed. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us 
us pray. Almighty God, in holy baptism, you have knit your chosen people together into one communion of saints in the body of Christ. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace, God of mercy. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to share the new life in Christ, God of mercy. Give courage and faith to all who mourn and sure and certain hope in your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. God of mercy. Grants to us, who are all still on our pilgrimage, and who walk as yet by faith, that where this world groans in grief and pain, <coughs> your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your life and life. God of mercy. Help us in the midst of things we cannot understand to believe and trust in the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection <coughs> to life everlasting. God of mercy. Yeah. God of all grace, we give you thanks because by his death our Savior Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death and by his resurrection he opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also. And that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death from the grave. And by his glorious resurrection, open to us the way of everlasting life. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, gave thanks, and said, Take and eat, for this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. And then later on, he took the cup and gave thanks. And he said, this is the cup of my shed blood for you, for the forgiveness of sin, but also for all. And in this cup is a new covenant, a new relationship with me. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The invitation is to come to the Banquet, for all is now ready. Please, an invitation to the table that is open to all. Please feel welcome at this table. Let the people come. <laughs>
strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commend Duke to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Duke. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. I invite you to stand as you are able. God invites us into his future, where the one who makes all things new has made his home among us. We are called and chosen, together embraced by the God in whom tears, mourning, crying, pain, and even death will be no more. Remember God's future, for this is our story. Our Lord says, see, I am coming soon. Come, Lord Jesus, let us go forth in peace 